Now with us is Federico Marani, talking about um, Ansible and DevOps. <laughs> So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Federico Morani, and uh, I'm going to talk about Ansible. Uh, Ansible is, uh, is a DevOps tool, and um, we've been using it for a while now. We've been using it for around a year and a half. Uh, kind of started with like version 1.2, I think, and then we kind of went through like some experiments, and then we we kind of turned all. Our role, our role infrastructure into uh, into Ansible scripts, and then we kind of like worked a lot on that idea, and then we kind of extended it to do like many other things, like such as code deployments and a lot of like kind of server setup. Um, like I've been trying some other tools, um, like DevOps tools, and. Uh, Ansible is a nice compromise because it's, it's quite simple and uh, like uh, it just works in the way the way I like it. Um, okay, so just to give give a bit of, a bit of introduction, uh, I I'm a coder, so I've been coding Python for for a long time. Um, I've been involved with some open source projects, uh, but like uh, you know, mainly company work. Um, I coded with like many languages, some, you know, Python, I did some, some Scala, I did some PSP in the past. Um, and I also like, uh, always liked the kind of the system inside of things because it's, it's quite nice when you, when you know, when you know both sides, you, you can code, you can deploy, you can configure server. So I always had an interest in, in kind of system first and then, and then moving, moving towards DevOps. Uh, I work for a company called Triaris. Uh, it's a startup. We are based in London. Um, I'm the head of engineering there. Uh, before that, I work with, with other companies. Uh, some of you may recognize some names. Um, okay, so so what is, what is the thing about like what like you know obviously we like talking about Ansible, but like what is the the real problem behind it. The problem behind it is, is DevOps. And uh, the problem behind DevOps is system administration, really. Um, you can do DevOps if you don't, if you don't understand system. I mean, you can, obviously you can use Ansible, but like Ansible is just a tool that helps you uh, to do, you know, the same system work, but like you still need to know system mean in order to do that, like it just kind of simplifies uh, some of the things, uh, but like certainly it doesn't tell you how to configure Nginx, it doesn't tell you how to configure sudo, it doesn't tell you how to configure, uh, you know, any other tools that you might you use in your stack. So, like, yeah, I mean, basically this feeling right, is lots of the complexity of system administration. Uh, so we really need to know how these systems work. And then you can use Ansible to simplify uh, your workflow, basically. Um, so what is DevOps? Um, DevOps is like basically like uh, one simple concept and is uh, having infrastructure as code. Um, so like just saying, historically, you had like uh, these figures called sysadmin, which like go on the server and then do this, uh, all this manual thing, and like nobody, nobody knew what they're doing, they were like to just doing magic on the server, and somehow the server got into a state it was working, and then suddenly these people, I like, leave the company and nobody knows like what they've done to the server, and like uh, we basically lose track of like all these changes. So, like, what changed some time, like some time ago, especially when kind of DevOps, uh, you know, became a big thing. Uh, basically, now every every change you do on this system is is going through this process of of coding, and then uh, you basically have the coding as a first step, and then these deployments of infrastructure changes, like uh, 
you basically roll them out on one server or many servers, like you know whatever number of servers you have. Um, what DevOps is about is about automation as well, because I mean we are all engineers, so we like to we like when things are automated, like this. There's less um, margin for error. This um, it's just pretty nice. You don't have to think about about uh, these things anymore. You just have this automation in place. Um, people leave companies, uh, so that's another good point. Like you don't want knowledge to escape the company. You want to keep the knowledge within the company, and anybody can read the code. Anybody can understand how the system works. Um, it's another point I, I feel strongly about, and there's a lot of DevOps tool out there which, like, they borrow too many ideas from programming languages. So, like, I mean, I, I love coding. I, I'm doing, I've done a lot of it, uh, but like, I don't feel necessarily the connection between like doing DevOps and doing uh, doing coding. Uh, so, I don't think DevOps should should not require programming experience. Uh, this tool is like, you know, Chef is really kind of Ruby based, for example, and the Puppet has like, you know, entirely its own language. Um, like I, yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, I was looking for a tool that kind of made this, this, this distinction a bit clear, and um, that's, that's when I came to Ansible. <coughs> Ansible is a really nice tool. It's really quick to get started. Uh, it's really easy. Um, it builds on top of like tools that we all uh, should know, like Python, SSH, uh, YAML files. It's, uh, it's, well, it's written in Python. Uh, it's extensible with Python. You can write plugins in Python. We can write plugins in, in other languages, I think. Um, like differently from other systems, is based on the idea of like pushing updates uh, to the server instead of the server be, having the responsibility of pulling updates. Um, like obviously, this this behavior can be tweaked, uh, but the idea is like you have you, you run Ansible on your on your machine or a management machine, and uh, it basically connects to every to every server and pushes. Uh, the operation that you want to run on the server. This operation may, may be like installing packages or maybe configuring packages, you know, whatever you chose to run. He has this push approach. Uh, the nice thing about this is it doesn't require, does require you to uh, install agents on, um, on the servers. It doesn't require, does require you to have a central repository of configuration files. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a different different way. Um, it's based on the idea of playbooks, so you can use Ansible in a in in a simpler way. But like, I'm going to talk about playbooks, um, and playbooks are basically a, a list of tasks. Uh, so there is like a task section which I'm going to describe, and there's another file called inventory file. Uh, so those are like the two basic files you need to set up. Uh, okay. You can use Ansible for many things. Uh, I generally like tend to distinguish it in, in two big groups. One is configuration management, and uh, if you want, you can use Ansible for code deployments. But like that's quite like a separate thing, I think. Uh, configuration management, like that's like the traditional way to use these tools. Uh, so when I say configuration management, I mean like installing like installing software on the server, uh, configuring like this software, uh, making sure all the all the demos are started, uh, making sure all the network interfaces are up, making sure all the firewall rules are set. Um, you know, this this sort of type of operations are like basically like the uh, traditional way to use these tools. Um, okay, so this is um, this is a playbook. 
this is like how you uh, kind of the basic file uh, for, set for using Ansible. Uh, it's divided in three sections. Uh, you got like cost section, task section, and end section. Um, so really the most important part here is the task section. Uh, in, this, in this playbook there are three tasks, uh, each one with a name and each one with, with an action. Action uh, is, in this case, is APT, uh, template, and service. So, I mean, this, this file is really easy, but what this file does is basically set up a Nginx server uh, on, on your machine, on, on many machines. Uh, so the very first thing you would do is make sure Nginx is installed, and it's the latest version. So to do that, you basically need one line. Uh, it's the APT line, which is like there. Uh, you specify the package name, and you specify the state you want the package to be in. Um, uh, when Ansible will run this, this action, what it will do is basically check if Nginx is already installed. If it's already installed and it's already the latest version, uh, it won't do anything. It won't cause any change in the, in the server. Uh, if it's not installed or if it's not if, or if it's out of date, it will be um, um, upgraded. Um, okay, so second action here, like something you probably do like for most of the software you install, you have to use your, your, your own configuration files. Uh, because, I mean, for instance, actually you, have, you need to set up, like, uh, you have a file to like, configure the website, so like, you, need, you need to upload this. Uh, template is basically a copy, but like with some pre-processing done to it, uh, just templating. Um, Ansible is using a Jinja. Uh, Jinja is a templating engine, uh, the same one used uh, with Flask, and the same auto Flask. Um, what the template action does is takes this um, Jinja file, and you, like feed it to the template engine, with a bunch of variables uh, that are available in Ansible. And you can specify also variables in playbooks. And that the output of this um, kind of templated file is then copied on the server uh, to that destination path there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. Um, third action here is the service action. Uh, service action basically it's an interface to Winiscripts. And uh, in this case, it's just about like making sure Nginx is running. So if it's not running, we'll call the Winiscripts to start Nginx. Uh, if it's running, it won't, it won't do nothing, it won't do anything. Uh, so the, um, there's another section, important section here called Andres. Uh, so the, the basic idea around handlers is basically you fly, like you list your handlers and uh, you can execute those on demand, like at the end of um, uh, of your task list, and you can execute them only uh, if there's been a change, like kind of associated to the, in this case, to the template action. So if the template action caused a change in the um, in the target server, it basically triggers the notify, uh, which is then connected to the handlers. Uh, so in this case, if the configuration file changed on the server, you want to re restart Nginx. So the notify will be triggered, and then the handlers will be executed. It's just like basically they are action you execute only when a notify has been called. Um, so the last thing here is the host section. It's actually a section you need, um, in, you always need, and it's basically like the, the, the group of servers you want to apply this playbook to. All right. So task order is important. That's how Ansible works. That's not how other tools work. Um, it's really kind of typical of Ansible. And uh, I mean, to be honest, like it really makes sense, like from my perspective, when, when when you 
set up like machines when you set up servers like you you would do things in order so like it's quite convenient for me to you know to reuse the same order when I define when I define this task it's really kind of a nice way to think about problems like in steps um, so like really kind of see the thing as it's it's an it's imperative programming so it's not like uh, you know, the order is quite important. And that's how you define dependencies between, uh, between tasks. Um, the other thing is uh, task card important, uh, meaning that like, you can execute the playbook as many times as you want, and uh, you won't try to install Nginx twice, you won't try to conf like, override the configuration file if, uh, if the configuration file is already on the server. Um, and that's a nice feature, and basically, like you won't you won't change the system, you won't try to change the system if the system is already in the state you want <laughs> you want that to be. Um, I already can describe the endos a bit. Basically, there are commands fly for later execution, uh, so they will be executed only if there has been a change uh, in the system. Typical case of reloading uh, a daemon. Okay. Um, so the last type of file that you need to set up is the inventory file. It's actually like much simpler than, than a, a playbook. Uh, it's just a list of uh, list of domains or IP addresses. You can group them by host group uh, if it makes sense to you. Like you know like. What we normally do is like list all the web servers in one section, list all the database servers in another section. Uh, we are monitoring servers. We have a trillion of type of servers. Um, like one thing you can do with inventory files uh, that we found really helpful is you can define like variables per inventory per host group. Uh, so, for example, like for all the web servers, you want to declare that the build environment is uh, production or staging or whatever environment you have. Uh, you may want to declare some database names uh, in case you're running uh, multiple versions of the same uh, of the same website on one machine. Uh, you can do the same thing like for database uh, uh, servers. Um, yeah, that's the feature we use a lot, basically. Um, okay, so I think the, the important things here are like uh, host groups, like really kind of trying to understand uh, how host, host groups work. Uh, I mean, it's actually quite easy, but like there are some little things that um, you need to know. Um, there's a feature called roles in Ansible. Uh, we found it like really helpful, especially because it basically defines like a common convention, like to include files um, within your playbook. Uh, so if you have like a long list of um, of tasks you need to run on the server, you may want to split this task in, into multiple files. I mean the same the same idea behind programming languages. You basically split split your file into multiple files. Uh, that's that's why there, there are includes and you should use them. And always try to use the action with uh, least side effects, uh, meaning uh, if you don't need to template uh, a file, you just, you just you can just use copy. Basically, there's, there's less chances to trigger a change in the server and um, change you don't really want to trigger. Let's say. Um, Okay, so this is uh, how do you find includes. Um, these are actually like a real snippet of production code we use. Um, so you can basically see the operations you do on the server yeah, on, on a more like logical level. Um, obviously to store web packages, there are like, you know, many packages or many configuration files you need to apply. You know, just try to see that like from a kind of, Iger ground, so like you basically install all the web packages, 
and then we configure Nginx, then we configure our supervisor because we're using supervisor. Uh, another thing we do uh, is uh, uh, have a day restore backups. And, you know, everybody should do like backup testing. Um, but like we restore it from production to staging. So you can do conditional includes uh, if you want. And uh, all, the all the tasks in this include will be included only uh, if the variable is, is, you know, if that is evaluating to true. I'm going to come back to the conditional stuff to this, this will be more later. Um, you can tag operation. Uh, tags meaning you can just write tag SQL and any keyword. Um, that's quite a nice thing because sometimes you only need to execute parts of your um, Ansible scripts or you may want to ignore some tags and that's a nice way uh, to do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So that was like kind of the basics, basically. Uh, went through the playbook, went through the inventory files, we did some other things. Um, um, but like the, the operations you do on configuration management, they are, they are quite similar. Unless you do, you know, a sort of like lots of Java demos to start or anything <coughs> crazy like that. Um, the other thing we use Ansible for are code deployments. Um, the problem with code deployments, though, is that they can be really custom. Like the really, like one, like you know, when you write uh, things like for configure servers, uh, they always you know they normally quite standard. With code deployments, like like it's really personalized, like for your. Uh, for our environment, uh, we have like you know a ton of Python. Uh, we are ba mainly based on Django, so uh, you know this is actually like some playbooks that work well for us. Uh, but like, you know, just to describe, you know, the basic things we do: we basically create virtual environments. Uh, we store pip dep uh, dependencies in the virtual environments. Uh, we use uh, Bower, we use like Node.js, and we use Grunt like to do compila uh, compilation of assets like server side. And uh, I mean, Ansible has, has some support for some support for these tools, and especially npm. And it doesn't support Bower, but I can always uh, run shell commands, so you can run Bower install uh, with the shell command. Uh, we use Grunt, so. Uh, we just trigger a shell command to, to run the ground compilation server side. Um, there's some you know standard operation you do with Django, like you basically collect all the static files, you run the migrations, you uh, you want to run the migrations only in the case the migrations are not, are not already <laughs> applied. Uh, and yeah, I mean there is some setup to do that. Uh, using whiskey, so when um, when we finish all this, we are starting whiskey. We start salary. We start you know everything we need. Um, okay, so basically, in this extra code that we have, like the sort of, like it gets a bit trickier because there's like you know on this there's many things that we need to add which are not not standard. Um, the, already introduced the conditionals. Conditionals are basically can be applied on, on any task, and it's just like an extra line saying when and then uh, an expression. Expression is, uh, is evaluated using Jinja, so you got all the power of Jinja for free. Um, in this case, like we don't want, like when we deploy something, we, we need to know what environment we're deploying. So we force the failure if the app environment is not defined. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's quite easy. Uh, we just want to know the environment. Um, OK. Uh, so another operation that we found uh, quite useful, uh, we used this in, uh, in a few places, 
uh, is a register operation. And the idea behind register is that, I mean, you can register uh, a variable name, and that variable name at the end of uh, at the at the kind of the end the, the end of the execution of that task will contain some information about the task. Um, so the problem we had is we want, like I want to deploy to production only the version of the website which are, are um, have been tagged with a version uh, because I know if they have been tagged with a version they they are stable so they probably be deployed. Uh, there's no tax git tag support uh, in there's no like native model to do tax uh, to read git tags but you can still use a shell command uh, so, so we run git tag we uh, put the output of this command in the git tags variable and then we can reuse that that variable in a conditional uh, later on so in this case like um, the condition is um, is in production and the tag is not in the git tags list. In that case, uh, we need to fail. Like I don't want to deploy to production version that they not they not be tested. Um, yeah, and one thing to add is git tags uh, basically contains many properties, and one of these properties is the standard output, but it also contains exicodes, um, like the time uh, this command took, um, many other things. Um, yeah, okay. just just go and check, check the website, just written everything there. Um, one thing we, uh, we use a lot uh, in, in a lot of places is is this, uh, this uh, with items? Um, so sometimes you want to run the same uh, the same action multiple times on like on many packages, or you want to store like, for example, like many pip packages or many Debian packages. Um, what you can do is repeat the same action, copy and pasting it like for every package, and it might make sense. Uh, this is certainly like a, like a nicer way to do it. Um, so you basically run the same action. It's basically a loop. You run the same action on on many on many items. Uh, in this case, we want to install virtual and supervisor uh, with pip. Um, uh, another th nice thing uh, that there is in Ansible is uh, something called facts. Uh, facts are uh, basically data coming from the server, from the current server. Uh, Ansible facts may be like the host name, for example, or the IP addresses that this machine has, or the mount points, or a distribution name, distribution version, um, data about CPU, about disks, and you may need to, to use some of this, some of the information uh, when you, for example, write, you know, write template files or, or you directly in the Ansible playbook. In this case, like, we as a company use uh, Ipsat, and they will, like, I want to let everybody know that, like, something has been deployed on a particular server, uh, with Sensible, there's a model called Ipsat. Uh, it's already done for you, so you don't, you don't need to you know, write any Python code to, do, to talk to Ipsat. Uh, you specify the room, uh, you specify the message. Uh, the message is a string that can be, can be a template. And uh, basically what happens is uh, this action will be run for every server that is in your playbook. And uh, each time this action is run, you will get like a different message. So let's say they deploy to uh, www, deploy to whatever your host name is, and you get that as many times as, as you have servers. Um, okay, uh, so uh, there's a lot of packages in Ansible, and I mean, Ipsat is just one of the many. Um, there are some which are a bit more standard than others. Some of, some of them are really specific on 
with CC2 or with uh, DigitalOcean or like some something or like interface to backtracking system. Um, the actions or modules uh, that we normally use are APT because we're using like Ubuntu everywhere. Um, a service, if you want to like kind of interface with any scripts. Uh, pip packages, if you want to install pip packages. Uh, we use Git. The pro with Git is, um, is quite limited. Uh, you can only check out repositories. Um, you can do any, any other Git operation, uh, which are many. Uh, there's a file um, um, module if you want to check the, the presence of directories, if you want to check the presence of files or links. Um, and then there's some more modules specific to um, the Python world, like Supervisor, for example, is one, or Django Manage. Uh, their interfaces uh, to run Django management commands or supervisor commands. Um, uh, but as I said, there's many more. Um, so just to give you like an idea of the size, like we have um, more than a thousand lines of playbooks. We do a lot of things with them. Uh, we have like around, we have four environments, some of them production environments, some of them staging environments. Uh, we actually have more than the production, production machines because I just, I just added a couple. Um, we run like PostgreSQL, we run uh, Neo4j, we run Nginx, solar machines. Um, as basically like the way you set up all of them are, is, is quite similar. Uh, there's a bit of extra setup for Solar and U4J because they're based on the G JVM. So um, we have like that machines, like every one uh, of the team has like both like local machine and uh, and the DigitalOcean box, so they can deploy anytime. Uh, we have some branch machines. Uh, we run like on uh, multiple cloud providers like AWS, DigitalOcean, uh, Abby Vagrant Box is set up with Sensible. Uh, so basically, it's, it's quite nice because you do Vagrant up, up, and then it runs the um, provision automatically. So you actually get like the final server. It takes a while, but like you eventually get it. Um, Yeah, I mean, that's uh, getting to the end of the talk. Uh, you know, like a few uh, suggestions. Just try to keep server stateless. Uh, if you have, like, you know, especially when you scale, like, you really need to, like, not, for example, like, store a file on a particular server and not on another, uh, because that file will become, like, state, and then that's the kind of the thing that will stop you uh, when you have to scale, when you have to have more than uh, more than one web server, or more than like you know many web servers. And the nice thing about DevOps is kind of allows you to do things in the right place. Uh, so you can do like IP geol uh, geolocation, for example, both in code or or in the server, uh, like in infrastructure level. There's like um, models for Nginx to do that. Um, so you might want to configure Nginx in a way that does a geolocation for you, uh, or, you or you can do it in the code. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions. Okay. Um, so the, my question is, I was reading that Ansible can also handle load balancers, so there's like a model for a file load balancer. Do you have any experience with that? Uh, we like we use load balance. Oh, sorry. Um, so you were asking about the load balancer and if we use like load balancer modules when we do deployments. Uh, so you talk about a specific type of load balancer or load balancer? Well, yeah, my company briefly got five, but basically. 
question is rather whether we have any experience with absolute load. Okay. Uh, we use load balancer for some of the one actually one of the environments we have. Uh, the well, like we, we still do it manually pretty much, uh, but like there's, there's a lot of support like for EC2 load balancer and, and um, <coughs> other type of load balancer. Uh, but yeah, I mean we don't we don't do it. We we kind of do the, the process manually, so we take the machine off the load balancer. And then we deploy to that specific machine and then do this thing manually, basically. Is there a best practice how you structure the files using NSQL? So um, where do you put which files and how do you manage it? Uh, okay. Uh, so the question was uh, about uh, if there is a specific convention about like kind of uh, where you put files and what. Ansible rules are the thing that in kind of forces you a lot of there's basically a lot of convention. So especially when you use Ansible, Ansible rules, uh, it basically automatically gives you like a folder structure you need to you need to follow uh, when you kind of declare the various sections. I think besides that, you can pretty much come out with the structure you want. Um, Uh, how do you control who gets uh, to configure structure? Uh, so how do I get to control who figures who like kind of uh, does the infrastructure, sets up the infrastructure? Um, I mean, you can like because everything is like kind of um, committed to repository. You can always use the repository to do that level of control. Uh, who gets to deploy this? I mean, if you have the kind of SSH permission on the machine, uh, it basically means you can run Ansible. So, like, the the control is really kind of built on top of SSH. Um, I mean, there are tools that you can put on top of Ansible if you're not, uh, especially when you use management servers. Uh, and this uh, tool they release called Ansible Tower. Uh, I don't think it's free, or maybe it's free for like some like a limited amount of servers. But like as as it stands, basically the control is is uh, on SSH. So if you have the SSH key, you can configure SSH. Server. Um, sorry, how do you copy an SSH key? Uh, no events. Uh, uh, do we have a single management server? Yeah. Uh, where everybody who has permission to access the management server gets to configure all of the infrastructure? Yeah. Or uh, do we have several developers who have SSH permissions to some of the machines? The way, the way we do it now is uh, basically like I have the permission to, like, to kind of apply these configuration files, uh, scripts on all machines. Uh, setting up like a management server now to do that. So, sorry, the, if you have an error in the, in the playbook? Yeah, then the handlers are running. Because uh, mm -hmm. the handlers, uh, the notification handlers are only running with the old playbook of the uh, Okay. And uh, there is flash handlers which I just limited around the place now. Yeah. Uh, I want to know if there is So the problem is if there is an error in the, in the playbook, uh, Let's just say, for example, like you are copying a configuration file, and then like an error happens, so the handlers didn't didn't run. Like, how do you do that? Uh, yeah, that's that's really annoying. And what I normally do is like uh, you can either like force a change in the file, or like uh, I'm sure there are like you know more clever ways to do it. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, there's no, I don't, I don't have a perfect solution for it. Okay, that was it. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you.